Hello, I'm David Blumberg. Welcome to Conversations with Entrepreneurs. Today, I am joined by Prashant Filoria, the CEO of Funbox, based in San Francisco. Welcome, Prashant. Thank you, David. I'm glad to be here. Why don't you start us off? The audience knows the name Funbox because your company has become fairly well known uh, in venture circles, entrepreneur circles, and so on as a real rising star. But why don't you give us the basic elevator pitch? Tell us what Funbox does, what its niche is in the market, how it's differentiated from its uh, competitors or uh, others in that realm. Sure, uh, I can just share a little bit about Funbox. So we are a fintech company, an Israeli-American fintech company uh, founded in 2013 with offices in Tel Aviv, San Francisco, and Dallas. And we're focused on powering the small business economy through credit and payment solutions. So uh, what we do, which is pretty unique, is that we connect with small businesses transactional systems, whether it's their accounting software or their payment system or even their invoicing system or their bank account. And we use that connection to deliver working capital solutions to small businesses. So that's what Funbox does. Um, we do a couple of things that are pretty unique. Um, I'll just mention, mention them. The first is that we serve customers directly. So people might come to our website or to our mobile app, but we also serve customers by being embedded inside other platforms. So for example, if you're using QuickBooks or, or FreshBooks as an accounting platform, you may see Funbox embedded inside those experiences or if you're in the Synchrony Bank Merchant Center. So we also embed our service in other platforms. And I think the other thing that we do, which is interesting, is that we play heavily in the B2B space. So we serve B2C customers, but we do a lot of B2B. And for every customer we bring on, and you know, we've served you know, almost 200,000 customers to date, we learn a lot about them, but also about the other businesses around them. So we're sort of building out this graph of businesses in the US and their relationships with each other, their transactions. So we have sort of over 10, we know about over 10 million small businesses just through the, the customers that we serve. So that's a little bit about Funbox and, and sort of how we think about solving the working capital needs and the payment and credit needs of small businesses a little bit differently. That's, that's fascinating. Maybe tell us a little bit about how this, you know, unusual, unprecedented period of COVID has affected you. Um, I, I know that because of our many fintech portfolio companies during that early March, late February period when the, the tsunami was about to descend on us, a lot of people predicted that fintech would get squashed. And um, our portfolio, you included, has proven the opposite. It's been remark remarkably resilient. Um, I'll let you, you know, tell what you want about the, the company itself, but we've been impressed at, frankly, your, somehow your underwriting is better than average, um, maybe call it superior, and that that's allowed or caused or reassured that your lenders to stick with you. And the same has been true of most of our other fintech companies. So what is it about this new generation Funbox leading the pack of um, AI enabled underwriting that has allowed you to weather the storm so much better than many predicted? So David, first of all, I'd agree with your statement that in the very, very early days of COVID, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty about how the world would shake out. And frankly, we were asking ourselves the question, how would we perform? And you know how it is. You spend a lot of time working on something. You know, at Funbox, we spent the last seven years investing in our data asset and, and our machine learning platforms and all of those things. And we spend a lot of time, a lot of energy, and frankly, a lot of money. And you always ask us the question, is it worth it? Like, are we doing the right thing? And in a few short months following the sort of the downturn, it became very clear that Indeed, it was worth it. The investments that we had made uh, proved out uh, in better performance. So sort of a few things, uh, I, I can talk a bit about Funbox in particular, um, but then also talk a little bit more macro. Uh, what we found was in the, in the first few weeks when COVID hit, 
we started seeing uh, an increase in our own delinquencies, but nothing too significant. We, we, our delinquencies were in the low single digit percentages. They crept up to the high single digits, which is a lot, but not catastrophic. And then they went down again. And within a few weeks, we were back at pre-COVID levels. And quite frankly, for the last couple of months, we've been at historically low levels of delinquencies. Now, to put this in context, if you look at the performance of credit platforms that do put their numbers out there, you know, publicly traded companies, folks that securitize, the delinquency numbers are not single digit, but more in the 30, 40 percent range. So what we were surprised to see, and it, frankly, it was a surprise to us, I, I cannot claim to have predicted any of this, was that our performance wasn't just 10, 20 percent better, but the approach yielded like a three, four X better performance in terms of managing risk. So that was a great uh, point of you know, sort of confidence for us and, and our approach and our investment. And so I think there's a lot that we can talk about in terms of why, you know, why we believe we performed so well and, 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 and so on. But what we also saw in the market was uh, that it, this wasn't the case with everyone. And uh, we've seen the, the market thin out a little bit over the last six months. The number of players that serve SMBs through credit and payments has actually decreased quite a bit. And so uh, we find ourselves in a place where as as the recovery from COVID starts happening, we're, we're kind of very well positioned to grow uh, as, the, as the demand for credit grows, but the supply for credit is actually, is lacking quite, quite significantly. What, what do you think has, um, you know, generated that outperformance? Uh, you've really delivered better customer value, frankly, and, and at a seemingly lower risk. Yeah, I, I think, well, we are proud of what we've done. And I think the, the part that we're the proudest of is that we've delivered this business performance while continuing to serve customers. I think that's an important uh, 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 sort of a clarifier, which is we never stopped acquiring new customers, although we slowed down our customer acquisition. We never stopped serving existing customers. And so we continued to, through the downturn, doing all of those things while delivering strong business performance. I would say if you, if you start looking at the, the potential drivers of that, you, you brought up the first and perhaps the most important, which is our access to data and how we have invested in our data machine. Uh, I think uh, it also goes a little bit beyond the data to just broader engineering. All of our, all of our portfolio management, if you will, is all big into software. So there, as, as COVID hit, as we saw things unfold, it was relatively easy for us to change our, our approach towards serving customers through software as opposed to a lot of manual interventions. That was helpful. Uh, I'll mention a couple of other things that I think are also very important. One is diversification. So Funbox serves small businesses across all verticals. We've got professional services shops, we've got small manufacturers, we've got wholesalers, we've got B2C retail, a segment that's been hurt quite a bit. We've got e-commerce, we've got construction, you know, we've got contractors. So, so the heat map of Funbox is, you know, it's more like the heat map of small business in the US. So it's not overly concentrated on any one vertical. That's one. And I think the other thing is good old fashioned financial discipline. So what I mean by that is, you know, as in, in a credit business, it's, it's relatively easy to give money away. It's hard to get it back. It's always easier to grow and grow fast by being uh, a little bit loose in, in how you think about your policies and approach to building a business. Uh, and, you know, looking back, uh, I think we could have been maybe even twice the size of the company that we are today if we have, or that if we were more liberal, but then if, if that were to happen, I wouldn't be here talking to you with the COVID downturn. I'd be running around trying to sell the company uh, because it, we would be hurt much, much worse. So I think there, there, it's not just one thing, it's a few different things. It's the data and the engineering and our customer diversification, but then also sort of a, a disciplined approach to building the company that has, has helped us. 
why don't we talk a little bit about your transition? You started like five years ago as COO and recently been promoted into the CEO role. How's it going? What are the big challenges that you see uh, for the next stage? Uh, it, it was a very smooth transition. I have been working with Ayal Shinar, who's the, the founder, formerly CEO, now executive chairman of Funbox for the last four plus years. And we decided to make this transition over a year ago. So we were sort of making this change very gradually. So I'm sorry to let your viewers down, but the, the entire transition was a non-event in some ways. Um, I was running a large part of the business even before this. And conversely, Ayal is still very involved in the company. He just texted me while we were on this, on this podcast. Um, so, and in fact, I think we speak every day and maybe the only meal I've had outside of my home over the last six months was with Ayal. So, so we're very uh, working, so we're working very closely together. Look, I'm very excited about this. Like I've spent the last you know, 20 years in the Valley building product. Uh, I think of myself as a tech executive by profession, but a product manager at heart. And um, I joined Eyal, um, he and I got talking five years ago. I joined him four and a half years ago because uh, what I felt was there were three things that stood out. One was I really liked the mission and I felt that, look, this is a mission that I can understand. This is a mission that I can relate to. This is a, something real, like helping small businesses succeed through this financial power that would otherwise not be available to them. Second was just the quality of the team. Back then the company was smaller, of course, but the team was just world-class. The folks here in the US, the folks in Israel, you know, the, the, our data and engineering team in Tel Aviv is, is as good as or better than any team at Google or Facebook or Yahoo that I've worked with. And the third was just uh, the technology and the trajectory of the company. And fast forward four or five years, it, all those three are still true. I mean, the mission's the same. It's still equally inspiring. The team has grown, but the quality is very high and, uh, and, and we continue to, to build and to deliver. So, so in, in some ways, yes, it's been a big change in, in, in some other ways, it's, no, it's just the same, uh, but I'm very excited about, about the future. I think that we have a moment in time, you, know, you brought up FinTech and COVID. I think in some ways COVID is a bit of a defining moment for FinTech because on the one hand, it's clearly a challenge. It's a challenge for everybody. It's also a challenge for FinTech companies. And when your customers hurt, you feel the hurt, right? So that there it's a challenge. But it's also a massive opportunity. I think um, my, my barber, you know, banks with, a, let's say a national bank, I won't name them, but their last name rhymes with the word cargo. And, you know, there's a sense amongst our customers that they've been let down, not just once, but multiple times. Um, access to credit now with, with, with help in the stimulus funds and so on. And so there is an op people are, are hungry for, for, for like better solutions. Um, and whether that ranges from, uh, from credit and payments to thinking about um, their businesses sort of differently and serving them in different ways. Um, and also sort of the drive to digital has been such a secular trend which has accelerated over the last six months. Uh, I think there's a, just a huge opportunity uh, in, in front of us. So it's, it's, it's exciting and I'm, 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 very, I'm very eagerly looking forward to the next year or two of Funbox because, because we are, we're sort of so well positioned to be able to grow and, and have a bigger impact. Can you talk to us a little bit about you know, this addition of technology infrastructure that makes the customer feel delighted to be there? And yeah. Right. So you know, as a product person, sort of here's, here's how I think about the opportunity in FinTech and, and I think about it in the same way, uh, same way for Funbox as well. I think that many financial services today have been kind of architected around what was available in the past. And there are some financial instruments like I'm a bank and I have a depository account or there is a payment card or there is a, a line of credit or a loan or things like that. And people have tried to assemble solutions based on sort of what's available. But those solutions aren't always very aware of the business reality um, or, or the needs or the workflows of the customer. So a simple example would be, if I'm, if I'm running a small marketing agency and I just sent you an invoice 
for $10,000. I know you're going to pay me in 60 days, but if I need working capital right now, I just cannot go to my bank and say, can I please get $5,000 for making payroll while I wait for David to pay me? Because the bank has no idea who David is. Uh, they have no idea that I issued you an invoice. So th that part of my business is just completely obscured to the bank. So while I have an account, it's not very smart. It's not very aware of what I need. And so I think there's an opportunity, and this, this is where, for example, Funbox has through its integrations with accounting software and this business graph, we know that you issued David an invoice. We have seen David before in our business graph. We have some confidence that he'll actually pay you. We can advance you working capital. Now, that's a small example, but an important example of how you can reimagine a financial service through technology, right? And I think this is just one example. There are so many situations where a business owner needs to be better served and that requires some reimagining, some reassembling of your traditional financial instruments, right? Now, I think the key thing is that technology needs to work. And I think that's something where it's easy to say that, you know, that you know, we have AI and they have AI and she's got AI and he's got AI. But at the end of the day, like, is it working? Is risk being assessed accurately? Are you, and, and this is where, COVID just was a bit of a, of a moment of truth where it became clearer uh, around who was, who had robust technology and who didn't. I think if we reimagine these services using technology that actually works, where we'll end up is with, with sort of del delighted customers who are sticking with us or in the long term. So I think there is this uh, miss. Uh, there's this notion which I think is misguided that customers only want instant gratification and transactional relationships. The first part is true. Customers do want things to happen fast because as a business owner, you don't have a lot of time. You want to focus on running your business. So people do want things to happen fast, but they're also interested in longer term relationships because they want to be able to work with folks that they can trust. Yes. And I think that part is, is sometimes forgotten. Um, I'll give an example. Um, the other day, Eyal got an email from a customer and the customer writes to him saying, thank you for saving my business. And, uh, and of course, Eyal was very happy about it. And so he forwarded it to a bunch of us saying, hey, you know, God is I'm happy. And um, the customer said, look, if you're introducing any new products, put me on the waiting list because I really want to work with Funbox. So that is great. And then when I, and because he mentioned that I'm, I'm sort of sick and tired of my bank. And when I saw the email carefully, I noticed the customer had actually copied his bank on that email. So it just, it's, it is such a visceral example of a customer saying, look, I'm looking for a long-term relationship. I'm not getting it right. from the folks that I've been working with for the last 10 years. Like they're not helping me. So I be think there's a big need notice. there. Beyond notice. And I think that, you know, if you do all this right, you can actually build businesses that last, businesses that have strong fundamentals, both in terms of unit economics and customer level economics and all of those good things. Um, so I think there's a huge opportunity. And, and I think COVID with all, its, with all its disruptions and changes and the, the emphasis on digital interactions and the need for flexibility and agility uh, and so on has just demonstrated the, the, the magnitude of the opportunity. Um, so that's, that's how I think about how, this, how FinTech is gonna evolve over the next few years. And again, that's something that we at Funbox take very seriously and think very hard about how, how we can serve customers better through all of this. What advice would you give to entrepreneurs uh, thinking of starting a FinTech company these days? So you've got to start with the real problem that you're trying to solve as opposed to, of course, how do I use blockchain in some fancy way? So that's sort of my, my, my bias, right? Start with the real problem. Good. Spend a lot of time with, with customers or potential customers and soak in the reality of, you know, of, of their world. Um, it doesn't hurt to be laser, laser, laser focused on maybe even a very small segment of customers if you can get to know them really well. 
because I think it's better to go deep and understand a problem really well than try to go too broad. Yeah, um, agree. And and I think the other thing I would say is, uh, you know, as you as you grow, uh, I think don't forget business fundamentals. I think it's it's uh, at least or don't lose sight of them. Uh, it, you know, the pendulum always swings back and forth between you know growth at all costs on the one hand versus unit economics and the i don't mean this in an insulting way but the world of investing wakes up every 5 years and and remembers that unit economics actually matter <laughs> so uh, you know i think if you're building a business for the long run you're going to have at least a few cycles back and forth so don't forget the fundamentals of of building a business both at the transaction level but also at the customer level which i think is important a lot of folks focus on how can i be unit positive at the transaction level but then they don't remember the fact that it, it's, it's hard to acquire customers and you want to make sure that the relationship is deep enough that it creates enough value for them and for you over the course of the customer's life cycle, like the lifetime. So I think that's, that's important as well. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, no matter what product you're building, for most, of the, most products, whether it's credit or, you know, or you're selling a bag of potato chips, the single biggest determinant of whether you have a good product or not is do your customers come back? So retention and repeat usage, you know, be laser focused on those because regardless of the product or for 99% for of the products, like that's an objective view around are you building something good or not? And don't try to scale too quickly until you've got a product that you know is good based on those, you know, on the objective data around retention and repeat usage. So again, I don't think I said anything which is frankly very specific to FinTech um, because I think that, uh, that, that these principles are true more broadly. I will say, I will say one thing though, that, that as the internet evolves, you know, uh, and as innovation in fields like financial services becomes like a bigger thing, I think it's becoming, it becomes more and more important to understand not only the, the technology part of what you're doing, but also the, the financial services landscape. Like for example, if you're in credit, it's good to understand some principles of credit which have been around for the last 5,000 years and are not gonna change because you have a better AI system. So, uh, so I think it's, it's good to have some appreciation for some of the, um, uh, so the, the, the key aspects of, of the industry, whether it's insurance or payments or credit or what have you, sometimes folks tend to, in their exuberance to try out a new technology, forget that, you know, we're credits, we didn't invent credit, you know, in the last 10 years, it's been around for some time, just right. read in the history book. So uh, I think, I think that's, that's the other thing I, I just say that is just sort of keep, keep those broader things in mind. Well, Thank you very much today, Prashant. It's been fantastic, very enlightening, and a joy to talk with you. For more uh, conversations with entrepreneurs like Prashant at Funbox, uh, come and visit us at BloombergCapital.com. Uh, check our insights section. And then also, if you need a loan or to learn more about Funbox, go to Funbox.com. They're ready and open for business. Thank you very much. Thank you, David.